Welcome to the second lecture of Module 4, Writing Skills, and here we shall continue our discussion on writing skills and the types of writing. You are Group G1, comprising of the Departments of Biochemistry and the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics. I am Rali Yami Jama, your course facilitator. The session is 2020-2021. The course is GSP 1201-2201. Use of English, and the university is Bayero University, Kano. Now, in the previous module, that is in the previous lecture of this module, we discussed about writing as a skill, and we started our discussion on the types of writing, where we also we looked at essay writing and letter writing. So, to start this second lecture. We'll continue with the types of writing, and for this, we are going to start with report writing. Now, a report is a document providing an account of events that have been witnessed, work that has been carried out, or investigation that has been conducted, together with conclusions and often recommendations arrived at as a result of the investigation. So when you write a report about something, you are writing about something which you saw, or something which you did, or something which you investigated. And when you do that, you also write your conclusion. You don't just give the a report of the things that happened, but of what your conclusions are based on the things that have happened, what you've seen, what your findings are, and whether you have if you have any recommendations for further action or how to solve the problem or whatever recommendation with regards to what is in your report, you also include that. So a report, therefore, is a detailed account of events that someone has thoroughly observed, heard, done, or investigated and presented as an official document. You could be sent on a field trip, for instance, after which you, you, you are expected to, pr to produce a report or to present a report of the trip, what happened at the trip, what your conclusions were, and what your recommendations are. So this means that a good report will show signs of thorough investigation or thorough observation of the things that have been seen or done or heard, and this will be presented in a document that is official. So a report is usually written to guide organizations in policy formulation and decision making, and it is usually written on the basis of some stated objectives you know, for a particular category of audience. So normally, a report is written, an organization will send someone into the field to go and make observations, write a report, which will inform any decision that the organization wants to make. This it doesn't have to be an organization. It can be an individual who will send you out to go and do some uh, investigation or to go and observe something, write your report, and give them your recommendations. So that is a report. Usually it's it is written in order to guide something, like a policy formulation, what should be done to solve a particular problem or what should be done to address some issue and so on. So a person who is tasked with writing a report is usually giving instructions and guidelines on how to go about writing the report. This may include a format consisting of sections, headings, and subheadings so that the location of information can easily be followed. Often, when you are told to go and produce a report or to write a report on something, you'll be given a format. These are the headings. These are the things we want you to look at. So under each heading, you will now write your observations, your findings, your investigations, the things that you discovered, all of this, you write them under the different subheadings so that the person to whom you are submitting the report can easily locate particular pieces of information that they are looking for. So a report can have a particular format. Now, a good report has certain qualities. That is to say, Writing a report is also a skill, just like the other kinds of writing that we've discussed in the previous lecture. So for this one, 
what is the quality or what are the qualities of a good report? The first one is that it must be clear, accurate, and unambiguous. We've already spoken about ambiguity in the previous lecture, that you should be clear, state exactly what it is you want to say in clear, unambiguous language, a language that is straightforward. A good report is supposed to be well-structured and highly organized, and it should have sections and subsections. So when you write a report, there should be sections, and there should be subsections where necessary under those sections because clarity is what we are looking for, precision is what we are looking for, and easy access to required information. So this is why structure is highly is um, is highly regarded with regards to writing a report. When you write a report, it should show a sign that it is structured, and that's why it needs headings and subheadings. And a good report must be informative. You don't just write whatever it is you want to write. A report is something that is required, and therefore it must contain information, information that is useful and that is relevant to what the investigation or what the observation had set out to do. So it has to be informative. And a good report must have clearly defined objectives and a scope. So a report is supposed to say what were the objectives of the investigation or the research or the observation, and what is the scope. What is it? You can't be told to go outside and write a report on everything. There has to be a scope, a limit, that this is what is going on, and you are expected to produce a report on only one A, only on only A or B or C, not on A, B, and C. So your own focus is the is what you are supposed to report on. If you are asked to only investigate one aspect. That is what your report is supposed to be about. It should not be about other aspects that you are not asked to investigate or to observe. So it should it, it should have your objectives and it should have a scope. A scope is that particular area where you are expected to produce a report on. And a good report must consider the needs of the potential readers. If an organization sends you out to go and um, produce a report, you should keep in mind why they want you to produce the report, what are their needs, so that a report will be determined to have been done well if it meets the needs of those potential readers. Slide four, the language of reporting. So these usages should be avoided in report writing and formal discourse. Just like in formal letters and in essay writing, there is a particular kind of language that you use when you are writing a report. And there are kinds of language that you don't use when you are writing a report. So the ones to avoid are contractions, that is isn't or is not, can't or cannot. We've already spoken about contractions in the previous lecture. Clichés, which are overused phrases, phrases which have lost their meaning and their effect. For example, in a nutshell, it is against this background that at the end of the day, the fact of the matter, at this point in time, in the final analysis or in the last analysis, these are all cliches. They are expressions that have been used and used and overused. So avoid them. Idioms are, should also be avoided, such as put all your eggs in one basket. That is the icing on the cake. It is a pain in the butt. You need to bury the hatchet. Call a spade a spade. These are all idiomatic expressions, and there is no space for them in the language of reporting or in a correct and properly written or produced uh, report. Contractions, cliches, idioms on this slide. Slide five, we continue with things to avoid in good report writing. Archaism, and these are words or phrases which are old fashioned or obsolete. Example, the, the, like I mentioned in the previous lecture, what, we, what you might call Shakespearean English. So please uh, um, avoid this as well. Slang is also um, not a good thing. You shouldn't write uh, this or blimey or cheers or affluential or um, gobsmacked, chuffed, haggle, you know, wonky. These are all slangs. So slangs should be avoided at all costs in a good report. The next thing you should avoid are uncommon abbreviations or acronyms. So there are abbreviations and acronyms which are regarded as standards. For example, BUK, UNICEF, even BBC, you know, CNN, 
These are abbreviations that many people already know. And GOVT for government, or SCH for school, or MR for Mr. or MRS for Mrs. So these are common, and at least they will be known. But apart from these kinds of abbreviations, there are others, especially those that are used in text messaging, which should never be used in formal writing, such as writing B and 4 for before. So please avoid these kinds of um, abbreviations when you are doing um, a report writing, because a report writing is a formal kind of writing. And so all the things that you avoid in the formal letter, for instance, should also be avoided in writing a report. So as with letter as with letter writing, there are basically two types of report. Of course, before we speak about them, the, their nature, formality, and purpose defines how reports are classified. And uh, you can see that you could have routine reports or eyewitness reports, investigative reports, progress reports, research projects reports, and so on. But we'll see how the informal report differs from the informal letter because there are basically two main types of report, the formal and the informal, and we are going to start with the informal. So in an informal report, this does not follow the rules and guidelines directed by an organization. It can be written to send information to only one person or for a small number of individuals, and such reports are usually shared among co-workers within an organization in the form of a memorandum. So what we are saying here is that the informal report does not follow any rules or guidelines. We mentioned that often when an organization sends you to produce a report, it will give you a sort of structure or guidelines on what is required, sometimes with headings and subheadings and so on. But if it's in an informal report, then it is, not, it is informal in the sense that you've not been commissioned to write it by anyone or by an organization. And so it doesn't have any rules or guidelines. You can just write it, a report on something so as to convey some kind of information, maybe to just one person or to a small group of people such as your colleagues in your place of work. So this is why it will be called, called an informal report. Before we move on to the topic on this slide, let me just mention with regards to the informal report and the informal letter that there are differences. Whereas in the informal letter you are allowed to use whatever kind of language you want to use, including slang, contractions, and familiarity, We'll find that in a report, there's still a level of formality in the sense that these things are discouraged. So even if you are writing it for one person or a group of people, even if there are people who you work closely with, such as your colleagues, you don't use the kind of familiarity that you use in the informal letter. So I just want to clarify this so that you don't imagine that simply because it is called an informal report that you can write it anyhow you want. So let's move on to the formal report which is also known as official report because it is meant for official purposes, not just something you write without being uh, told to do so. So it is written to provide information, analysis, or analyze issues, or make recommendations on how to solve a problem or to make a decision. So examples of a formal report will be research project, police report, or evaluation report. When you write your research project, if it includes when you do some research, you may be asked to write a, a report on the research. So if it's a research project, it's a report because you are, you are reporting based on research that you have carried out. When you come to write your project at the end of your uh, coursework, you are reporting on what you have found based on your observations and your investigations. So it is a kind of report. That is why it has a formal structure which you have to follow. That is why it has chapters, chapter headings, sub subheadings. That is why it has a sort of format that you have to follow with preliminary pages and so on and so forth. So this is called a proper formal report and you write it to report to an organization or to an institution. Then, so what, are, what, 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 what is the structure of a formal report? The structure of a formal report depends on your departmental or organizational, organizational requirement. For example, when you come to the English department, you will find that there are slight differences between the projects written by students of who are writing in literature 
and students who are writing in language. You find that the format differs slightly. For example, if you are writing in language, you are doing BA English, but uh, you special you want to specialize in language, what you can also call linguistics. You will be doing what is called data analysis, methodology, case study, and so on. But when you do literature, what you are doing is this textual analysis. So you take this uh, theoretical framework with its conceptual uh, grids and you use that in the analysis. And uh, you will mention that your work is desk-based, whereas if you are doing language, you will mention that you have some field work or some interviews, depending on the kind of things you do, think that uh, you've done as your research. So this, this, you will find that then it means then that the report, the structure of a report or the format of a report is based on the departmental or organizational requirements. But the format explained on the next slide is largely used in writing formal reports. So this is what we are now going to see. So we're now going to consider the format of the general format of a formal report. Any kind of report, if it is formal, will have will generally have these things. There could be more specifications depending on department and institution. But almost all formal reports will have these um, this general structure. And it begins with the title page, where this contains the title of the report, the name of the reporter, and the date in the report, uh, the date that the report is compiled and submitted. Just like your projects, when you go to your department and check your departmental library, you look, you see projects there that have been submitted. When you open it, you will see that there is what is called a title page, and on that page, you will see the title of the work, you will see the name of the writer of the project, and you will see the date that it was submitted to your faculty or to your department. Now, after the title page, you also have what is called a table of contents. This table of contents gives information on where to find which segment or section of the work. It gives you a list of the topics that have been treated and the page numbers for those topics, including headings and subheadings or titles and subtitles. After this comes what is called the executive summary, which we don't use here in uh, the academic. What we use instead is the abstract. This abstract is a sort of condensed summary of what is contained in the report or in the project. So it's a kind of very brief explanation on the contents of the report. It gives a kind of summary of the purpose of the writing, the method that was used in the investigation, what the major findings are, what the conclusion and the recommendations, if any, are. So this is the abstract. That means it is a super condensed summary because, in fact, for many reports, you'll be given a fixed number of words outside which it is no longer an abstract. You'll be told to write the abstract no, not longer than 250 words or not longer than 500 words. Depending, again, it also depends on your department or your, or your organization. After the abstract, that's the actual work proper, where you get your introduction or terms of reference. And in this section, what you do is to discuss all the necessary background information, your aim and objectives of the report, as well as the definition of any abbreviations or acronyms that you have to use or you've used in the report. So sometimes, you know, these abbreviations or acronyms are unavoidable. You will use them throughout the report. So in the introduction, or in other words, in some instances called terms of reference, that is what you do. You give the background of the information. You mention what your aim and your objectives are, and you define any abbreviations or abstractions or acro sorry, any abbreviations or acronyms that you've used in the report. After the introduction, you now mention your methodology. What sort of method did you use to do the investigation? So this means you are now going to describe all the methods that you used to gather the data for the report. That is, if you used equipment such as cameras or um, 
audio recorded and so on, you will, you will mention them. What sort of procedures you used in collecting data, whether you gave people questionnaires, whether you conducted interviews, whether you simply sat and observed people, or whether you held discussions with people, you will explain this. This is also part of your method. And then you also have to explain the limitations of the methods that you use, as well as all the problems that you have encountered. For example, if you will say that uh, you conducted interviews, what are the limitations of interviews? One limitation of interviews might be that people may want to tell you what they think you want to hear. That is your presence. May not The fact that they are speaking to you may not allow them to be as honest or as open as they would usually be. So it is in this case that a questionnaire might have some kind of advantage, especially if the questionnaire is not going to be signed. Their names will not appear on it. So people might tell you things. They will write things. Uh, when they are answering the questionnaire, they may tend to be more honest because no one is observing them. So these are called limitations. Even in the questionnaire, there are limitations because the answers, the, the, the answers that they can give are limited in the sense that when you are doing an interview, the answer that a person gives you in response to a particular question can make you raise another question that you did not want to ask before for clarification or which you feel is an important issue that needs to be discussed more. But with a questionnaire, there are limitations. Once the answer is given, more information cannot be given or there can be no digressions or no different or more questions can be uh, introduced. So these are what we call limitations and they have to be mentioned here under methods of investigation or methodology. Now after that, you will you now write your findings and your conclusion. So after your methodology comes your findings. What have you found in the course of all these investigations that you've done and because of all the data, based on all the data that you've gathered, gathered what are your findings? And what do you conclude out of the findings? So, to further support the result of the investigation, you may also use diagrams, tables, and graphs. These are there to show that you did collect the data and you know how to use it or to analyze it. And this is also followed after you've done that, you now give your conclusion, which may either take the form of highlighting the most important points of the report or show the overall significance of the research. So two ways of doing conclusion here. Either you bring out the most important points that you've got, you found out, or we give an overall conclusion as to the overall significance or impact of the research. Either way you do it is fine. It's left to the person who is um, putting together the report. Now once you've made your conclusion, the next thing that follows is your recommendation. Based on what you've found, Based on what you've seen, what are now your um, recommendations or what is your recommendation? And this usually takes the form of a call to action. You recommend based on your conclusions that this should be done or this should not be done or this should be promoted or this should be suspended or this should be stopped and so on and so forth. So the recommendation must be in line with the findings of the report. You have seen this. This is the evidence you have provided. It. We've done the interviews or the questionnaires. You've drawn the graphs and the diagrams. You have seen the detrimental effects of something or the negative effects of something. So based on that conclusion, that um, action is a bad thing, and your recommendation is that it should be stopped at all costs. For example, the cutting down of trees. You, you do questionnaires. You conduct interviews. You observe people. And over the course of time, you notice that forests are disappearing and uh, the climate is changing as a result of that. Maybe global warming or you find that uh, the desert is encroaching um, faster towards uh, the, um, human settlements and so on. So these are your observations. And therefore, you conclude that cutting the, cutting, the indiscriminate cutting of trees is a bad practice, it is dangerous, it will not help humanity in general. And so your recommendation now becomes that the government should do something to stop it 
either enlighten the people as to the dangers of cutting down trees or put laws in place or heavy taxes on those who um, cut down trees without proper documentation or without a permit to do so and so on you know I'm just giving you examples after a recommendation you have what are called what is called appendices or annexes and in this section the reporter will include all the supporting documents and information used which have not been included in the report and this can include the questionnaires the transcripts the graphs and so on you know when you conduct interviews you are supposed to transcribe it write it down what they have all said so this will be your part of your appendix uh, it won't be inside the main report but you can attach it so that they can see it as evidence if it is a questionnaire that you tendered you can put samples or either if the questionnaire contains names and the people are supposed to remain anonymous you just put the template for the questionnaire without the answers that anyone has given so that's um, how you do it or you can put the sample samples of the questionnaires um, a selection of the questionnaires that have been answered and attach this to the report this is called appendix because you, you can't put it inside the report after the appendix or appendices or annexes you then have your bibliography and the bibliography is the section where you list in alphabetical order according to author all the published sources that you have referred, referred to in your report if you cite any published sources any book any essay any material even when you cite a news report you should you should mention this in the bibliography this is to avoid the accusation that you have stolen ideas that are not your own and therefore you are guilty of plagiarism so this in the bibliography is where you acknowledge all your sources according to author in alphabetical order the next kind of writing we're going to talk about is the CV or curriculum writing this is the sort of writing that you do when you are applying for a job when you are seeking a job and the CV also called a resume gives information about you what you have what your achievements are what your credentials are where you are at currently whether you've held other jobs previously or not why you want the employment what benefit you are going to bring to the new place of employment and so on so it's supposed to explain all of these things to your prospective employers it's supposed to give all the information that is required and that is necessary in order to get you employed the idea is to present a favorable impression give a fav favorable impression of yourself in the CV so you can see why it's not just about the information that you give but also about how you write because how you write um, gives an idea of the sort of person you are whether you are a careful or a careless person how organized you are whether you are capable of presenting your thoughts and yourself in a coherent manner now there are several um, guides to writing a good CV which have been identified by the University of Southampton and uh, there are in fact there are 10 of them in number and this is what we are going to look at in the next slide the first rule in writing a CV or resume is simplicity because a successful CV should not be over complicated with too many categories or too many inform um, or more information than is required that is to say you give exactly what is needed and you move on you don't go on telling stories about yourself or about your home life and so on and so forth whatever you need to say should be said simply and it should be straightforward the second thing is the highlights so because CV is a marketing tool because you are marketing yourself you are selling yourself um, you should make sure that it highlights all of your personal and professional achievements so that's the highlights the highlights are the important parts about yourself that you need to put out there and a CV 
which is the third point, should be truthful. You should not fabricate anything. You should not falsify any information or document. You should not claim you have a master's when you know that you only have a degree. Or you should not claim you are a graduate when you know that you are still in the university. You should not claim to have held a job somewhere when you know that that is not true. So you must always tell the truth in a CV. A CV should be should show uniqueness. And this is in the style and, and tone which opens the writing. That, sh that is, it should be, um, the style and the tone should be personal to yourself. It should show, it should indicate the kind of person that you are, how you present yourself. Because the CV is sort of um, a kind of representation of the way you speak. And you know, people judge you by your tone, by the way you talk, by the style of by your style of talking, how you speak to others, how you address others. So in other words, you should be direct, you should be positive, and you should it, it should have that personal touch. So when we say personal here, we're not saying that you should go into intimate, personal details about yourself which are unnecessary and which are unrequired. Only that it should be unique, it should show, it should make someone want to meet you. It's like when you read the writings of good writers, you feel, wow, I wish I... I could meet this person. I would love to see this person. And uh, or if you meet them, you say, oh, I'm a great fan. It's just because of their style, the way they have of writing. So the CV should have that sort of um, personal touch to it. A, TV, a CV should also be tailored. Because the contents of the CV should be tailored in line with the current job application requirements, as well as the job description. That is, you need to be flexible when writing a CV. Sometimes, the CV cannot contain everything. It's, you look at the job that you are applying for and say things about yourself that are relevant to that particular job. For example, if you are applying to be um, a chef, you will mention that you've been to culinary school, that you are a good cook, you, have, um, you, are, you, you won several cooking competitions and so on. But let's suppose you are also a good swimmer and you are the swimming champion in your high school. Now, this is irrelevant to your job as a chef, unless if you are applying for the job as a chef on a boat or a yacht. In that case, or on a ship that is uh, going on a cruise somewhere, in that case, your ability as a swimmer is relevant because you would then be able perhaps to save lives should the ship capsize or whatever. But if you are just applying to be a chef somewhere on land, it is not important that you should mention that you are also a champion swimmer. So um, you have to tailor the information that you give to suit or to fit the job that you are applying for. A good CV should be word processed. That is, it must go through a word processor. What does this mean? That it should be typed and that spelling and grammar should be checked. The word processor is something that will check all of this for you. It can check the grammar and tell you if a sentence is incomplete, whether it's a phrase or it's, uh, there are problems of concord and so on. And uh, it will also check your spelling. So you need to avoid using slang, colloquialisms, and cliches. This should be avoided. And so this is the need for the word processor. A CV should be succinct. That is... It needs to be short and concise. Employers don't have time to read pages and pages of self-description from someone applying for a job. And they are not impressed with all these long pages or volumes of information. So it should be straight to the point. There is what is also called reverse chronology. So in all the subheadings of a CV, it is the most recent event that should come first, followed by the next and so on. That is to say, when you are listing your achievements or when you are listing your credentials, you start from the most recent achievement. Let's suppose you have a PhD. So instead of saying, beginning the CV by saying you attended primary school in this so and so place, or that you got your BA in a Bayer University, and then you got your MA in APU, and then your PhD in Alabama, you should start from the PhD because that is your most recent and your highest achievement. So the latest thing that has happened to you, which is relevant to the job, that is what you start with, and then you go progressively um, 
Noah. So this is why we say reverse chronology. Because chronology means arranging things, things as they happen in time. So if you reverse it, it means you are starting from the latest to, to the earliest. And then you need a review. So you should give your CV to a respected colleague or to your mentor to critically um, proofread and review it. When you write a CV, you should give it to someone who you trust, who will critique it and write something about it and do a review on it to review it for you so as to tell you whether it is good or to see things that you yourself may not see and help you with it. The last thing is that a, a CV should be typed in A4 sized paper. That is the usual paper that uh, you have your handouts or your notes or you, you find in uh, when you go to make photocopies and so on. So it should be typed on A4 sized paper and you use an appropriate font size. Information should be well spaced so that the CV looks neat, qualitative, professional, and easy to read. You can use bullet points to identify se separate information, but make sure that you never use colored text in a CV. So you should use a good font size, appropriate font, font size. Don't write your CV in tiny font that people have to struggle to read, and it shouldn't be too large that it, it, it takes up too many pages. So the font size should be appropriate. Uh, font size is the size of uh, the writing on the page. That is typed writing. Also, it should be well spaced out. Don't squeeze everything into one place. There should be adequate spacing between the lines. Usually 1.5 spacing is, uh, is okay for some CVs, single spacing. But 1.5 is, is good. And uh, it should look neat. So you need to maybe justify for those of you who do not know the computer or the, or the typewriter, it's when you justify, it means all the lines start and end at the same uh, point, except for maybe when you reach the end of a paragraph, which does not extend to the end of the line. So it should look blocked and uh, so on. It should look neat. That's um, the the requirement. And uh, when you are listing, some, you're giving some information as a list, you can use bullet points. But just... Make sure that you never use colored ink. You never use you never use any color in a CV. It should all be just uh, regular black type. Don't type in red or in blue or in green because you want to look fancy or whatever. It should be formal um, and it should be in black on white paper. So on this slide, we are going to look at the format of writing a CV. That is the structure, what it's, what it's supposed to contain, the sections that it should have. Um, uh, even though um, certain organizations could have their own peculiar requirements, generally this, these, what we shall be discussing here cuts across all, um, all CVs. So the first one is personal details. And this is positioned at the top of the page. It includes your name, your professional title, and your contact details. Now, under no circumstances should you make the title of your CV as curriculum vitae or CV. Instead, your name should be taken as the title and should be followed by your address, phone numbers, and the email address. So, that should be the first thing that should appear. You don't have to write on top CV or curriculum vitae. No, you don't need that. All you need to do is just, your name is the title of the CV and then you continue by giving the rest of the information that is required, marital status, address, phone number, email address, and so on. The second thing is the personal profile. This is called the personal statement or your career profile or professional profile. And this one is the most important, uh, sorry, it's one of the most important parts of a CV. It is usually just a short paragraph that gives your prospective employer an overview about who you are, what your career goals are, and what you can offer to the company, just like I've been explaining since we started this discussion on the CV. So this is where you talk about um, you, you talk you, this this is where you talk about what your goals are, what what you are, what your achievements are, that is what your credentials are, and so on, and what you can bring 
to the institution or to the organization or to the company what your contribution will be and why because that is what will determine why they should employ you so this is also contained in a short precise and concise paragraph and it should be tailored to the job that you apply for we have already explained that so you shouldn't talk about details that are not necessary or important or relevant to this job that you are applying for so the next thing is to give your employment history and it should start with the most recent or even the one that you are you are doing at the time because you could be it, it could be the case that you have a job but you are you want to change or you are, you are applying for another job elsewhere so you start from the one that you are on or the, the most recent employment that you have had even if it is not paid employment if it is a a, a job you are doing where you are learning some skill which is relevant to this new job that you want to apply for you should mention it so for each um previous position that you have had or, or held or previous position that or previous job that you've had you should state your title that is the title of the job what kind of job it is you should mention the title you should mention if it is an organization that you work for you should mention the organization mention the date that you are employed and the date that you left the job or you finished the job or whether you are still on the job you mention all the projects that you did or you were involved in uh mention your position in the job whether you are at the top the middle or uh lower up, um position should tell talk about the responsibilities that you have held what your achievements are on during the when you were employed there or on the job and the experiences that you have gained so this this gives the current employer an idea of how experienced you are what you have done where you've been and so on and so forth so if you have many years worth of experience you can reduce the details of old or irrelevant roles yes um uh you may have a, a, a person who has had so many years of experience has held many jobs in many places uh, on different dates and times and it may be too much for the employer so just remove those that are not terribly necessary or important and leave only those that are the most important ones those that would be most relevant to the job at hand the next thing is your education and qualifications and this should be written in also in a reverse chronological order i've already explained this when i said that if you have a phd you should start from the phd then the masters then if you have a postgraduate diploma or not then your ba and so on and so forth so this you you mention it and you include the name of the institution where you attend where where you got the phd from that is the institution in the schools you attended and you mention the date on which you got your certificate so it's not that uh, you, you mentioned the date you started or ended not necessary but you mentioned that you have a phd from abu zaria 2023 for instance something like that so this is followed by the qualifications and the grades that you have achieved so in the case of examinations like waec or neco you need to include details of all the subjects you have taken and you should, they should be grouped together as nine waec credits or seven neco credits and so on so if you are just a secondary school uh, graduate you've had your waec you mentioned that you start for so and so and so subjects you start for the credits uh, sorry you start for this number of subjects and you have this number of credits if you are a graduate from the university first degree you mention what sort of the um, class your degree is whether first class second class upper or lower third class and so on so this is all important because it contributes to the overall impression or image that you are projecting to the prospective employer and it gives the whole picture it the picture of the person you the, the applicant is building in in the eyes of the employer you could also have additional sections to the cv after the ones that we've already mentioned and these are additional these are these, these sections will contain some information that doesn't really fit in the previous section but which you feel will improve your chances so for instance you can have a section on your key skills that is you, you this um comes before the employment history you can include your language and your computing skills you note the level of fluency as well as your evidence of uh, 
using them. You can mention that you speak several languages. You mention them. You mention your skills in these in these languages. If you are multilingual, you know, for instance, if you speak Chinese, even though you are just applying for the position of engineer or nutritionist or whatever, you can still say that you are fluent in Chinese or you are fluent in French. This is a good thing, so you could add add that. So you can also include any other skills that you think is appropriate to the job, just as we mentioned previously. Also, your hobbies and your interests, because you are a human being, and this gives an idea of the kind of the quality of person that you are. So if you feel that your CV is still lacking, you can improve it by including your hobbies and your interests. But you must be careful not to include hobbies that may hinder your chances of getting the job. So you should draw only on those that are relevant to the job. Here's an example. If your hobby is playing video games, I don't think it will help you at all in a job application. So you shouldn't mention that. But if your hobby, if one of your hobbies is reading, for instance, people respect people who like to read because they know that you'll, you'll gain knowledge. So you can mention that that is your hobby. Or if your hobby is doing something similar to the job that you are going to be employed for in your, pre in your free time, then you should mention it. For example, if you are if you are going to be if you if you are seeking employment as a nutritionist and you mention that your hobby is baking or your hobby is uh, making cookies or your hobby is teaching children how to cook um, or your hobby is giving free classes to women in your neighborhood on uh, the proper diet to feed their family. You see, these are hobbies that will supplement um, your skills as a nutritionist. So then it, it will be important in such a case to mention to mention it. Or if your hobby is reading cookery books, for instance, if you are in biochemistry, you mention that your hobby is um, experimenting in the lab. You have a private lab at home where you do some of some small experiments and so on. That will be of benefit to you. So you mention that. But don't mention hobbies that are likely to be detrimental to to, to, to your employment. References are also good. So in this section, you identify reliable referees and include their names, their job titles, uh, their contact details, and their connection to you. Alternatively, many people decide to omit this section or state that references are available on request. So it is important though to seek prior permission from your referees. Now for some, up, for some CVs, you need to mention who your referees are. This is just standard. It is required with regards to some institutions or organizations. Others do not do so, but you can still mention that if they want referees, they could request for the referees and you'll give them. In either case, if you are going to list your referees, make sure you list their full names, where they work, the de their details, that is their contact, so that what you have mentioned will be corroborated. And this means then that you need the permission of these referees before you include them in your CV. So you have to be careful about that. You shouldn't write the name of anybody as your referee or mention anyone as your referee without first having gotten their permission. So these, are, these sections are additional sections that you could have in your CV. To conclude our section on the CV, let's look at those things that you should avoid in a CV. The first one is a headshot. In some countries, it is common to include your picture on your CV. But in Nigeria, this practice is not allowed. So it is not required. In some countries, you may put it. But in Nigeria, it is not done. So be careful. If you are applying for a job in Nigeria, please don't put your picture on, on your CV. The age and the date of birth. These, the only dates that should be on your CV are those about your employment and qualification information. Your age should not determine your ability to do the job you are applying for, but these details may even count against you in many instances. But this is not cut and dried. You have to uh, know this. Some institutions would want to know your age. So unless it is asked for or it is required, then you don't have to mention your date of birth. If the institution or the organization you are applying for requires to know how old you are because there are some jobs that are not available to people of a certain age, 
then you should provide it. But otherwise, if you are just preparing your CV, you don't need to write your age and your date of birth. Marital status is another information that should not be included in a CV as it does not influence one's ability to do a job. Many a time, marital status of an applicant may be used to discriminate against him or her. So again, when you are writing a CV, you do not need to include your marital status. Again, I should mention here that this is not cut and dried. Some places may want to know your marital status because you may be applying to a place perhaps that is a religious institution or um, an institution where uh, it is uh, required that you be married. Perhaps you are going to apply for guidance and counseling to married couples. You are applying as a guidance counselor to married couples. So it may be good if you mention that you yourself are married or you yourself are divorced, in which case you still have experience and so on. So the marital status may apply in some instances. But otherwise, if you are just writing a regular CV, then you don't need to mention the marital status. Because whether you are married or not, may not necessarily affect um, how you perform, but it could lead others to be biased against you. For instance, if you are a female and you mention that you are married, um, your employer might think that uh, maybe let's leave this one because she may have uh, family issues, her husband may decide to cause problems and tell her not to come to the job, or her children may, may, dis, may be a distraction, etc., etc. So unless you are specifically required to provide that information, it's better to just leave it out. The next kind of writing we shall look at is the email, how to write an email. Email means electronic mail, as many of you will already know, and it is one of the newest and most sophisticated ways of um, correspondence between individuals and between organizations. Um, it is a message which it can contain text that is writing, it can contain files, you can put images or other attachments through the, um, through, sent through a network to an individual or a group of individuals. So the email, you can attach things to it. It's not, it doesn't just have to be just a text. You can put pictures, images, videos, files, and so on. And it has the, the, big, the greatest advantage of the email is that it is faster and it is more instant than other kinds of mail, what we call the snail mail, that is the regular mail where you go to the post office or to the express, uh, sorry, to the, to the post office here yeah, to post it and so on. So the email, when you send it, it can, it, 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 it can be delivered instantaneously and can be read by whoever it is you are sending it to. So through an email, an individual can instantly transmit a large volume of information to a wide range of recipients because you can add recipients. So instead of sending, writing the letter, making copies of it, putting each one in an envelope and writing a different address and sending it to all these different people, if you, if, if you, are, if it, that is, if you want to send it to more than one person or organization, for the email, all you simply need to do is just to Provide the list of uh, recipients. You keep adding, adding, adding. 100 if you want, more than that if you want. And the moment you click send, it instantly sends to all those people at the same time, which means that your email can be read, in fact, instantaneously at the same time by all the people that you have sent it to. So that's a big advantage of the email. However, for someone to send or receive the email message, you must have an email address and you must connect to a server. So an email must contain a username and a password which allows you, you to access the email. That means that you can't send emails if you yourself do not have an email address and if you are not using a server. So this is important. Also, all organizations have an email. Nearly all. It's likely even that you'll find an organization now that doesn't have an email address or a website. And they use this to correspond with their employee or their employees as well as with the general public. So some of the commonly used online email services include Gmail, Yahoo, and Hotmail. Those of you who have email addresses, I'm sure you, you are using one or the other of these um, online email services. So that is just the brief in, uh, introduction to the email. So there are several stages 
when you come to write an email. Um, an email can be viewed or received through a computer or a cell phone that has an internet co connection. That is, the computer or the cell phone has to be connected to the internet. And when you are going to send an email, you must first access your email account. That is to say, the, and that's why we mentioned that you can't send emails if you don't have an email yourself. So you access your email address or your email account. And after you've accessed your email page, you should click on the Compose button. There's a button that says Compose, or you'll sometimes in some applications, you'll find that it is just a picture of a pencil. So this means that you want to compose, you want to write something new. So you click on that bet, um, button, and a panel which as will appear, which contains three options. The first option is designated to. You will see to means to whom are you sending the email. So here, you put the address of the person you are sending the email to. That is the email address of the person. The second panel contains the tag subject. And this one is optional. You can write the um, a brief description of the contents of the message, just like the subject in a formal letter. And then the last one is the compose email button, in which the actual message, what you want to say or what you want to write, um, is contained. Now, one advantage of the email is that if you want to attach pictures or audio files or videos even, you can just simply do so by clicking the attach file button. And this one, when you when you click attach file, it will um you will it will it will lead you to different locations in the computer or on your phone where you have your pictures, where all your files are pictures, documents, videos, recordings and so on. So you, all you need to do is just to scroll, select the file you want to attach and click on it. Now, after selecting the appropriate file, you should then click on the send uh, button. That is the send message, and instantly your message will be um, transmitted. So these are the stages that you follow when you want to send an email. The next type of writing is the minutes of a meeting. Whenever you hold meetings, you are supposed to document what has taken place, and this is called minutes of the meeting. And this the minutes of a meeting is among the primary responsibilities of a secretary of a department or an organization. Usually when you're at a meeting, the secretary of the organization or the secretary of the meeting will take the minutes. But you may not have a secretary. You could just be holding a minute, uh, sorry, a meeting among yourselves as students, in which case you need to appoint someone or ask someone to please take the minutes of the meeting so that whatever deliberations or decisions you take at the meeting will be documented for future reference. So minutes of a meeting is meant to is meant um, to take note of what happens for any membership meeting. The notes are called minutes because it's a record of official business that occurs during a meeting. And the secretary has to first study the agenda of the meeting, which serves as a sort of skeletal outline. Before any proper meeting, um, an agenda will be distributed or made known. The agenda is the topics or the concerns or the issues that are going to be addressed at the meeting. So this agenda can serve as a sort of uh, sketch or a sort of outline for whoever is going to take the minutes. So you take the agenda, let's suppose there are five items on the agenda, it means then that you'll, you'll, you'll use those five items as sort of like so subheadings when you are taking the minutes. So that under each agenda or under each topic or subheading, you now write what, what deliberations were made or what decisions were taken or what observations or what the discussion was about. Now, what are the features or characteristics of minutes? The minutes should indicate, first of all, the date, the time, and the place of the meeting, the name of the chair of the meeting, and a list of those who are present. So it should have the date, the time, and the place where the meeting takes place, when and where. Then, this is followed by attendance, the name of the chair of the meeting, who is chairman or chairwoman, chairman or chair lady, the chair of the meeting, and then um, a list of the persons who have attended the meeting. That is, this will be under the heading attendance. A minute should also record an explanation of any matter, including any motions made and actions taken, whatever resolutions have been made any action that has been taken, 
any motions that have been put forward, suggestions, observations, um, discussions, and so on, this should be, the minutes should be a record of such things. And it should also indicate the next meeting, the date, time, and place, that is the time of um, adjournment, and the writer's signature, name, and date. So at the end of a meeting, usually if it is an organization, it will the, the minutes should indicate when the next meeting is going to take place. After mentioning the time that this meeting closed, it will start at a certain time and it will end at a certain time. So the time the you, you, when when you are starting the writing of the minutes, after the attendance will say perhaps the chair opened the meeting at or the chair declared the meeting open at so and so and so and so time. And then at the end, you say the meeting was adjourned at so and so time. Then you put your signature, that is you, the writer of the minutes. You sign the minutes, you write your name, and you write the date. The next kind of writing is the memo or the memorandum. Now, a memorandum is a kind of correspondence meant to convey information to members of an organization or to other organizations and bodies. So it's another way through which information is shared within and outside organizations, all right? And in some disciplines like law, for instance, a memo is regarded as a record of the terms of a transaction or a contract, such as a policy memo, memorandum of understanding, which is called MOU, memorandum of association, etc., etc. And there are two types of memo, internal and external. So you can see that sometimes the memo is not, it's not just um, a document that is meant to just convey any kind of information. It can be a record of a particular transaction or a contract. So that, that when, when, you, when you have a contract between yourself and another person and the law is involved, that is there is a lawyer involved, you may, have, you may wish to draw up uh, a memo which is a record of that contract or transaction that has taken place or if you come to a sort of understanding between like two organizations, you'll find that lawyers are there to take care of the legal side of things. So the memo will be called a sort of MOU or Memorandum of Understanding. Now there are two types, like we said, of memo, the internal memo and the external memo, and we shall see the difference between the two. So what is an internal memorandum? This is a memo written and circulated to people within the same organization, and this is why it is called internal. In other words, internal memo is a brief written communication aimed at passing information from an organization to its various employees or between and among officials in the organization. So if the organization, that is the heads of the organization, want to pass on some sort of new information, they will use what is called a memo. For instance, let's suppose that an organization notices that there are unwanted um, or uninvited visitors keep entering the building, people who don't have anything to do in the building or have no business with the building will simply walk in, sit down, perhaps there is free Wi-Fi and they make, they, they, they make use of it and it makes the place chaotic or they, they, they ruin things or they litter or their presence just disrupts the general atmosphere or the general appearance of the organization and the organization wants this to stop. So it can bring out a memo that is the head of the organization or the head the chief executive or whoever can send out a memo to staff that henceforth nobody will be allowed into the building without first showing the ID card at the entrance to the security guard. So this is a kind of announcement for all members of the organization which they need to take note of. So this is an example of an internal memo. So what is the format of, um, okay, so the topics of an internal memorandum may range from general notification, request for action, or an invitation for meeting. So the format of the memorandum varies from one organization to another. There are always peculiarities wherever you go. So that is, in writing a memorandum, some organizations may have specific formats peculiar to them. So depending on where you are, the memo could be different. But in general, an internal memorandum has this format. A heading which comes at the top of the page and it shows the name of the organization as well as the caption internal memorandum. So you see the name, there's a heading, 
That is the name of the organization. And then you will see internal memorandum written. And it also has a from. From comes at the left hand side of the page and it shows the title of the officer writing the memorandum. Could be from the general manager, could be from the chief executive officer, it could be from the director of finance, it could be from the head of security in an organization. So this is the from aspect. So after internal memo, you give information as to who is sending out the memo, who is it coming from. After the information on where the memo is coming from or who the memo is coming from, you now the next thing you see is the to, that is who the memo is addressed at. So this comes below the from and it indicates the designation of the recipients of the memorandum. That is to say, it may be public, everybody can see it, but it may not necessarily be addressed to everybody. So that means that it is from someone to someone or from one part of the organization to another part of the organization, there are certain recipients. For example, if it is matters of, the sec of building security that are going to be addressed, an, in an internal memo could be sent out by the head of security of the building, and it is so it, that will be from head of security of whatever building it is or company or whatever to all security personnel. So you see, the memo does not apply to secretaries. It doesn't apply to directors or other uh, workers. After the two comes the date, and the date is written below the two to indicate when the memo was sent out. Then this is followed by the subject, and the subject or the title of the message is written below the sections that are above. That is after the name of the organization, uh, internal memo, um, from and to and date. You now have the subject of the message, and that is written after all these things have already been written. It can be written in upper case alone or in upper and lower cases. You can choose whatever case you want. Then after the subject, just like the subject in the formal letter we discussed, comes after the subject comes the body. And this is the actual information the memorandum intends to convey. And after the information, which is always brief, generally it's just brief, because it's just a memo. You are just um, sort of giving some sort of information or instruction or whatever. So it tends to be very brief. So that is the body. After the body comes the name of the writer, who the writer is. That is, the from indicates the office of the person. And then whoever wrote the memo is the writer of the memorandum. And that's the name that appears at the end of the memo. So you can see before you a sample of an internal memo. You can see the name of the agency there and its address, then followed by the heading internal memo, and then from the general manager to all the staff, date, and then the, the subject, which is notice of meeting, then the body, this is to inform you that the annual end of the year meeting is scheduled to take place as follows, followed by that information concerning the end of year meeting and an agenda which will be discussed at that meeting. And then finally, you can see that the writer of the memo, Muzammil Haruna, has signed his name. So the second type of memo is the external memorandum. And this one is usually written to send messages to the general public or to other external organizations and bodies in order to convey information on certain specific issues. So it is not meant to remain within an organization, but to spread some sort of information to places that are external to the organization. So in other words, an external memorandum is written for the people outside a company or organization, and it is written in a more, uh, it, it has a more formal approach than the internal memorandum. And in most continuous writing tasks, the external memorandum has an introduction, a main body, and a conclusion, just like any other kind of general uh, a piece of writing as we discussed in our essay writing. And it is important to note that the format differs from organization to organization. And this is why we have not given a sample of an external memo here, because the format tends to differ depending on the organization. But most external memoranda 
are written in the form of formal letters. They just look like the regular formal letter that we have already discussed, despite the fact that most organizations tend to have their own format, which is unique to them, of sending out um, the, their external memoranda. So with this, we come to the end of this module, module four. We've had two lectures, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next module, module five.